Well, ladies and gentlemen, if we can begin, welcome to this forum event. We have a, Harvard is uh, delighted uh, to welcome our guest, Mr. Uh, Yushushi Akashi, a man who his whole career and experience has been dedicated to furthering the cause of international organization and the peace and development, which is at the essence of the charter. His background, which I can mention because it may elicit questions. He has a, an address today on uh, chapter seven, but his background and his work as both uh, a student and a practitioner of international diplomacy is truly quite a fascinating, extraordinary one. Graduate from the University of Tokyo, an MA from Virginia, man who has lectured at Columbia and Yale, and therefore we're delighted that Harvard can join that august company. Japan's permanent ambassador to the United Nations, a man who then became closely associated with the work, the United Nations work on disarmament, and today we're all happy that the U.S. Senate has approved the, the uh, chemical treaty. Then, from that critical work on disarmament, being thrown into the real cockpit of the United Nations work, the Secretary General Special Representative to Cambodia, where he wrote a book on the 500 days on probably the single most ambitious mission that the United Nations has ever attempted in both peacekeeping and nation building. And if that wasn't enough to try and, a, and direct United Nations efforts in Cambodia, he then became a special representative in the former Yugoslavia. Today, he is Under Secretary General of the Department of Humanitarian Affairs, that crucial coordinating body, wherever there is a crisis in the world, in Iraq, where there is starvation, where there's deprivation, we find the UN and its specialized agencies, and we find the Department of Humanitarian Affairs to coordinate that crucial work. So we have with us a guest who can speak about many facets of the United Nations organization and work, and I couldn't be happier to welcome him to Harvard. I'd like to thank uh, Professor X. Uh, Worthy for his uh, very kind uh, introduction. I'm uh, delighted uh, to speak to you. The, the prestige of uh, Harvard uh, permeates all over the world, even in the most sacrosanct enclaves of the United Nations. Uh, so I'm uh, very happy to have this opportunity of uh, speaking to you about some of my thoughts on the subject given to me, uh, which is prospects for peacekeeping operation under Chapter 7. Indeed, a very provocative uh, subject matter. Uh, but uh, I'd be happy to expand into other broader areas of uh, UN challenge and uh, interest during the discussion period. Today's subject, peacekeeping under Chapter 7, has remained topical throughout the present decade. You may recall that when the 1990s began, there was some euphoria in the belief that a post-Cold War model for the achievement and maintenance of peace was imminent. This belief was based on the growing relevance and authority of the UN Security Council, the growing number of increasingly complex and successful peacekeeping missions being initiated by the United Nations, 
the success of the Chapter 7 enforcement mission in the Gulf, and lastly, the initial broad acceptance which greeted the 1992 report of the UN Secretary General Boutros Ghali entitled An Agenda for Peace. Early in the decade, in my book, An Agenda for Hope, I observed the end of the primacy of the military factor in international politics. At the same time, I pointed out several challenges which remained to be faced. First was the growing complexity and size of modern peacekeeping missions and how they could be organized and managed in ways that were coherent and focused. Next was the recognition of a new set of emerging values and philosophies. While the East-West contrast on the issue of human rights and state rights remained intact, the world increasingly faced assertive behavior by ethnic groups within states. There was, however, the absence of consensus on a code of behavior for multinational states and states with ethnic minorities. And these are the majority of nation states today. Finally was the increased frustration of the vast number of UN member states which are not represented on the Security Council and which saw the Council's present composition and membership as somewhat an anachronistic based on the old rather than new world order. It is my view that as we approach the end of the turbulent decade and century, these challenges remain essentially unresolved. And along with other factors have inhibited the capability of the United Nations to act effectively under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. One other complicating factor is the nature of armed conflict which has prevailed in our decade. Conflict around the world has changed dramatically following the end of the Cold War. Without searching for an explanation for this development, I'd like to note two important changes. The first, where conflicts used to be fought between two or more states, or a state and a revolutionary movement, now they tend to be fought by loosely knit, poorly controlled, ill-disciplined combatants. Even if one of the parties happens to be a recognized state, it often falls into the ambiguous category of failed or failing states. Second, previously, Parties in conflict tended, tended to have strong backing of either United States or the Soviet Union, which provided the patrons, their patrons with strong influence over their surrogates, as well as an interest in winning the support of world public opinion. Now, in contrast, the United States and Russia, for different reasons, are much less likely to support parties in conflict. And when these or other countries do provide uh, such support, it is likely to be rather limited and conditional. This leaves outside actors with sig significantly less influence over com combatants who, in their quest for power, pay little heed to international public opinion. 
So, rather than having organized, controlled armies, influenced by powerful outside powers who had an interest in their international reputation, conflicts now tend to be fought by parties who have no regard for our even knowledge of international humanitarian law and whose odious battlefield behavior is particularly difficult to influence. As a result, conflicts such as those which occurred in Somalia, the former Yugoslavia, and Rwanda pro proved resistance, resistant to the conventional antidotes of diplomacy, UN Security Council condemnation, and indeed classical or so-called even second generation peacekeeping. I submit that this does not mean the end of the type of conflict which occurred prior to the Cold War and which politicians and generals spent many resources to prepare for and to deter during the Cold War. On the contrary, the international community acting through the United Nations will continue to undertake from time to time classical peacekeeping preventive deployments and multidisciplinary operations under Chapter 6 based upon negotiated agreements among the parties. Despite the predictions of some, there also remains the possibility of the Chapter 7 enforcement action, which will be initiated by the Security Council. None of these actions are adequate, however, to make, to meet the challenges which the prevailing reality of conflict presents. Fundamental question then is, can we overcome the challenges which inhabit the United Nations and, and its member states from acting under Chapter 7? I believe we can in the long run. Before going into the answer to this question, however, I'd like to set the stage by drawing upon some lessons from my experiences in the former Yugoslavia and elsewhere. The first lesson from the former Yugoslavia may appear quite obvious to you, but it is not necessarily so in attempting to prevent or suppress conflict, the root causes of the conflict should not be forgotten or avoided. The response of the international community to the Yugoslav crisis was to avoid the root causes of the conflict and to concentrate instead on its consequences by giving the United Nations Protection Force, AMPROFO, a primarily humanitarian role. While the UN Security Council <coughs> may have had good reason to conclude that a military or a political solution to the conflict was unlikely, this should not necessarily have led to the conclusion that there could be a humanitarian solution. The Amprofo mandate for Bosnia and the one which, to which many of the troop contributors continue to subscribe throughout was to create the necessary conditions for the unimpeded delivery of humanitarian supplies to Sarajevo and other locations in Bosnia and Herzegovina. This mandate was later expanded to include inter-area the following tasks. To provide support to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in the delivery of humanitarian relief, particularly through the provision of convoy protection when so requested, and to provide protection for convoys of released detainees on request of the international Committee of the Red Cross. 
Amplifor, therefore, although deployed under classical peacekeeping rules, had little to do with peacemaking or peacekeeping per se. First of all, there was no peace to keep. Despite the success in meeting its humanitarian mandate, its credibility with the parties in Bosnia and in the international press eventually deteriorated. The second lesson from the former Yugoslavia is that creeping towards a Charter 7 operations must be avoided. Just as the term mission creep has entered the military lexicon as something to be avoided, the experience of AMPROFO shows that peacekeeping operations runs a similar risk of mission creep. Between the period 25 September 1991 and 15 March 1994, the Security Council issued 50 presidential statements and adopted 55 resolutions relating to the former Yugoslavia, most of them relating in some way to Amprofo's mandate. In an arguably well-intentioned response to a deterioration of the situation in Bosnia and motivated by genuine interest in protecting besieged civilians and Amprofo personnel, the Council gradually revised Amprofo's mandate and introduced Chapter 7 enforcement elements to it. However, the Council perhaps did not recognize the long-term implications of this mandate shift, in particular that it would draw Amprofo inexorably into the conflict. This risky approach was rendered truly untenable by the effort to maintain Amprofo as a lightly armed peacekeeping force with very limited combat capability. As General Sir Michael Rose, an Amprofo commander in Bosnia, was fond of saying, you do not go to war in white painted vehicles. And he was right. The third lesson to be learned from Amprofo's experience is that a peacekeeping force, by its mandate or through its actions, must not create unrealistic ex expectations. Each passing resolution which added yet another expectation and tasks to the mandate eventually decreased the credibility of AMPROFO as well as its authority and legitimacy. A reason not readily apparent is that each additional resolution and each additional mandate represented an add-on. None of the previous components was, however, dropped. This meant that while impartiality was necessary in order to ensure that humanitarian action was not politicized, partisanship was needed in order to carry out certain mandate requirements such as protection of the so-called safe areas. And as you know, there were six such areas, starting from Sarajevo, Gorazdi, Zepa, Srebrenica, uh, and including uh, Bihać uh, and Tusla. The international community tried to put in place a safe area regime, essentially as an extension of the humanitarian-based mandate thereby requiring Amprofo to adopt a partisan stand on the one hand while operating as an impartial third party for peacekeeping purposes on the other. 
I say partiality in this context because the great majority of uh, population uh, in these safe areas constituted the Muslim population, which was one of the principal parties in the Yugoslav conflict. How these two tasks, humanitarian task and the peacekeeping task uh, to be reconciled was never fully explained. As one military commander stated, neither he nor his political leaders at home knew how to make love and war at the same time. As time went by and the expectations remained unfulfilled, and proposed credibility, and indeed that of the United Nations was severely tested. A fourth lesson is that troop contributors must endorse changes in mandates if they are to maintain unity of purpose. As the war unfolded, nations placed more and more restrictions on the employment of uh, their troops, no matter what command arrangements they had originally agreed to with the United Nations. In some cases, this occurred without either the force commander or myself being informed, so that the effect was not felt unless a new crisis had erupted. One example was the Croatian advance into Sector West, in which uh, uh, we were caught by surprise by the refusal to respond uh, on the part of some of the troops. Now, the final reason is that there's a crit critical point in a conflict before which prompt military action has a reasonable chance of being effective at minimum cost. Here the lesson is from Rwanda, where General Derea, who was the UN force commander in 1994, argues convincingly that with a force of 5,000, he could have prevented the conflict from spreading, thus saving hundreds of thousands of lives. In Croatia, the siege of Vukovar represented probably one such turning point. Following this event, fear, hatred, and acts of ethnic cleansing spread simply out of control. These lessons and others from other missions are bitter. They must be applied in such a fashion that mistakes of the past will not be repeated. The application, however, confronts the issue of political will. Moreover, it has to overcome the hesitation among some UN member states to intervene in the internal affairs of others. The, there are nonetheless new factors at play which combined into a co coherent package may help provide the necessary legitimacy, political will, and impetus for the con conduct of operations under Chapter 7. The first factor is democracy, which appears to be more effective than national borders in preventing the spread of conflict. Democratization then should be one of the goals of any peace operation. This means that since the growth of genuine democracy takes time, intervention cannot be a short-term, quick-in, quick-out adventure. The next is the drive for basic needs, liberties, and core human rights. As happened in Bosnia, the weakness of the tradition of human rights and the fear that the right of one group would supersede 
those of other, another group can result in a way which shocks human decency. The conclusion then for us is clear. If intervention occurs, it should encourage the development of respect for universal human rights. Tied to this is a need for sustainable development to place the country on a more secure economic footing. There's also need for an effective judicial system and the promotion of respect for the rule of law. Now, I'd like to come to the third category, which is the presence of ever-increasing international linkages. International public opinion can be mobilized quickly, making it difficult for groups to persecute others with impunity. International business is also increasingly active in many nations, persuading them not to repress or use violence against minority communities. Moreover, international governmental and non-governmental organizations with large followings maintain close watch and can bring pressure to bear on a government through exposure of practices that violate international norms. The manner of intervention should therefore take this reality into account, both in terms of addressing the crisis at hand and in terms of strengthening international norms. Finally, there's a drive to stabilize regional military forces at the lowest level necessary to provide self-defense, to encourage the spread of mutual confidence and security building measures, and to discourage the buildup of offensive weapons. This has taken several forms. The highly successful conventional forces in Europe Treaty, regional stabilization agreements under the Dayton Peace Accords in the Balkans, the Chemical Weapons Con Convention just ratified by the Senate, the, the drive to ban anti-personnel mines, which is uh, now acquiring a new positive momentum and the efforts to stem the flow of small arms and other conventional weapons. Underlying these activities is the impetus to strengthen international humanitarian law and to punish those who commit gross violations of international law as witnessed by the establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and for the former Yugoslavia. Ladies and gentlemen, these four factors I have mentioned combine to form the basis of a long-term strategy for action under Chapter eight, 7. Assembling these components into a coherent package certainly will take time and may not be enough. However, in some cases, they may have to be combined with military, economic, and diplomatic means under Chapter 7 in order to address emerging or ongoing conflicts. In summary, therefore, a Chapter 7 action will have the greatest chance of a long-term success if it contains the following elements. One, a security component to end or limit the conflict, to establish compliance with the international humanitarian law, and to create a generally secure environment in order that progress on other fronts may be achieved. Two, a democratization element to establish a legitimate governing authority and process a process through which competing groups can peacefully pursue their aims. Three, a human rights element to promote and achieve respect for human rights and development of an effective 
and the impartial judicial system. And fourth and last, relief and development component, including an effective system of transition from relief to reconstruction, both meeting emergency needs and beginning to build a sustainable economy. This is what you might call a carrot to be combined with whatever stick which might emanate from chapter seven. I'm fully aware that to accomplish all these is a, indeed a tall order. But these steps are vital if there is to be any hope of mitigating the effects of and eventually resolving the complex crisis which will no doubt will continue to appear on various parts of the world's stage. Each element must be considered, developed, and adjusted to meet the particular challenge of each situation. They all must be fully coordinated, although I'm aware that full coordination will be difficult to achieve. For example, attempts to integrate the military with the humanitarian component have proven, in my, in my view, less than satisfactory. The first principle is that military action to prevent or stop fighting is more effectively applied early in the conflict. Furthermore, the force must have sufficient strength to carry out what it is mandated to do. Early and in strength must therefore be the past first principle to be followed. A UN standby capability should in time be translated into a standing capability to react to the outbreak of a conflict in a timely and effective manner. Second, quick reaction requires accurate and up-to-date information and intelligence, a requirement now recognized at the, by the United Nations. While information exists in the public domain, intelligence must be provided by member governments. UN needs to further develop its early warning capability and its ability to analyze information that cuts across the Department of Boundaries of Peacekeeping, Political Affairs, and Humanitarian Affairs. The next guiding principle is a need for credible military capability relative to local conditions. An intervening force must at least be as capable as and preferably better than the local fighters, especially in discipline, equipment, and the resolve. This may mean elimination of a large number of countries from participating in more technically demanding operations, which is, will be unfortunate for a universal organization such as the United Nations. In the former Yugoslavia, the cost, time, and the effort necessary to prepare, train, and equip some contingents was never recovered. In many cases, their credibility was never established in the minds of the belligerents with some unhappy consequences. The fourth principle is that of conduct. While capability may be relative, conduct cannot be. For the soldier, the guiding doctrine must be the provisions of international humanitarian law, as well as the basic human rights to which most nations subscribe. The intervening force must possess moral authority over forces they are mandated to deal with. The next principle, fifth principle, relates to the mandate given to the military. In the type of conflict under discussion, the military component must concentrate on military and security tasks, while its tasks may be used to support other activities, the military focus must be squarely on security issue. It is vital that political direction based on UN Security Council resolutions be translated 
into broad strategic objectives which are fully endorsed, not only by the Council members, but also by the two contributing nations, preferably before they are being promulgated. With, without this step, unity of effort and therefore of command can never be truly established. The contrast between AMPROFOR's mandate and IFO's mandate uh, under the Dayton Peace Accords is quite stark. Unlike AMPROFO, IFO was designed and mandated to execute functions which were solely military. The constraints resulting from limiting the mandate to humanitarian objectives only, as was the case in Bosnia, must be avoided. UN peacekeeping, and to a certain extent, the military involved were degraded by their experience in Bosnia. Not because they did not do their job, they did it with great courage and competence, in my opinion. But because from the start, they were limited in what they could do without resources and tools at their disposal. This occurred because the international community chose to define humanitarian intervention in terms of foodstuffs and medicine and stopped short of grappling with underlying political issues and ensuring compliance with international humanitarian law in protecting the civilian populations. In sum, the military element which is actually needed for humanitarian intervention must be readily available, must be credible and relative to the belligerents. Belligerents must be capable of, capable of fighting if necessary to achieve its purpose. It must be prudent, prudent in the use of force behave in accordance with the rule of law, including humanitarian law, and be able to recognize and stop non-compliance. It must have a clear, achievable, and agreed mandate without uh, bluffs and false expectations which have plagued some missions in the past. It is essential that it receives adequate resources. Obviously, both military and humanitarian action can be effective only when it is conducted within a clear, widely accepted framework of political objectives. The one last question is how can this be all achieved? Political leaders must, in the final analysis, must ha have answer these questions. But I have some ideas as to how we can meet the security cha challenge involved. The first is uh, an ad hoc coalition of willing and able countries, which provide their own command structure. This worked, as you know very well, in the Gulf, but was decidedly, was decidedly uh, unavail unavailable in situations such as uh, Rwanda and was only half-heartedly uh, employed in the case of Somalia. The second involves the establishment of a United Nations standby capability. And the third possibility is the encouragement of regional organizations to set up and maintain a standby capability for activities within their region, an idea which President Clinton has proposed for Africa and seems to be full of promise. Ideally speaking, the international community should have all these options available for selection in a particular situation. I fully 
realize that there is still much to be done in preparing the military for its role in future operations under Chapter 7. Whether the requisite political will, which is uh, essential, can be mastered to take the necessary steps still remains to be seen. In tackling these issues, it is vital that we avoid the twin risks of either becoming too idealistic and visionary or becoming so skeptical and pessimistic that we are incapable of acknowledging the progress which we have already made and can continue to make in the future. Thank you for your attention. I want to thank our speaker for mentioning several serious crises, many of which he knows personally, and drawing lessons for the future of Chapter 7 and the future of the United Nations. So, as usual, uh, at uh, forum events, uh, we have uh, a period for questions. Those of you who would like to uh, ask questions, we have mics on the right and the left of the room. And I would just ask you to uh, identify yourself, please, uh, before asking your question. It's going to be a very brief question. Sabina Kaiser, I'm a student at the Kennedy School. I wanted to ask you if you could apply the lessons you've been talking about to Albania, because I think a couple of them should be borne in mind. In the case of Albania, UN Security Council authorized the establishment of multinational force uh, to be sent uh, to Albania to provide um, protection for the delivery of uh, humanitarian supplies. And this force has been brought together under the leadership of Italy with the participation of France, Spain, Greece, Turkey, Austria, and others. Uh, so, in this case, UN has given authority. It is not a UN peacekeeping per se under the direct command of the United Nations. And this is an illustration of what I mentioned as three uh, basic options for the UN uh, in the area of security. And the first being the formation of multinational uh, force with the participation of countries which are willing and capable of uh, contributing. And uh, uh, UN has humanitarian activities, assistant uh, missions there, which uh, is provided the cover of uh, protection by this multinational force. Uh, and uh, I, we hope that uh, the existence of, the, of this multinational force will facilitate the delivery of humanitarian assistance. Uh, in Albania, they are having uh, difficulties of assisting people in need, especially in the southern part of the country. We did not see the existence of humanitarian crisis as such. So, uh, we, you, Security Council will receive reports from the uh, countries which have provided uh, the contingents to this force every two weeks. And we have an uh, observer who participates in the meetings organized by Italy in Rome on this subject. So we intend to work with them. We watch their action and we hope uh, they, uh, the best for their accomplishment of, uh, of uh, the mission as uh, uh, described by the Security Council. Hello. Yes, I'd like to ask you about the decision-making mechanisms of the Security Council and in particular the veto that the permanent members have. Um, I happen to think that in the Yugoslavian war, the UN would have found a solution much sooner and much more effectively if the uh, veto power did not exist 
and either the American solution or the European solution led by France and Great Britain would have prevailed instead of the mixture of the two, which prevented either the airstrikes nor the ground activity to have solved the problem. So I wanted to ask you, what are the prospects for the veto power to be removed, which I think is an idea whose time has come. And I think this is reflected in the recent appointment of the new UN Secretary General, which uh, if the US hadn't vetoed Boutros Ghali, I think he had the overwhelming support of the international community. And this unfortunately takes away some legitimacy from the new appointment. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Can I just remind questioners to also identify yourself? Yeah, my name is Leandro Popic, and I'm from Argentina. The veto has prevented the Security Council from acting in certain situations in the past. But I'd like to warn against uh, placing too much importance on the existence of the veto, which has, on the plus side, uh, the, the role as a safety valve for the participation of uh, five permanent members in the work of the United Nations. Uh, otherwise, UN would, might have had a history of the League of Nations in which, from which um, many major powers uh, withdrew. The United States did not even participate. Uh, I think the problem in the former Yugoslavia was not so much the, pro the provision of the veto, as much as the very serious division of attitude of, of, uh, of national interest among five major countries which constituted so-called contact group. United States took the position in favor of Bosnian government, composed mostly of uh, Muslim population. The Russian Federation took a position Sympathetic to the Bosnian Serbs, because, partly because of orthodox uh, connection. France and the United Kingdom took a position uh, which was that of uh, neutrality in the conflict and uh, accepting essentially the status quo. And Germany taking a position uh, somewhere between the position taken by the United States and France and the United Kingdom. So when uh, there's lack of unity among major players in the international uh, domain, uh, UN action tends to be paralyzed. And I would like to stress that for a successful conduct of UN peace operation, not to speak of peacekeeping operation, are uh, first of all the agreement among the parties in conflict to accept a framework for peace. And second fundamental condition is the unity of outlook, outlook in the international community, particularly among the major players. And so to that extent, certainly the Security Council action on the, in the former Yugoslavia uh, was prevented to, to be effective because of this disunity among the major players. Uh, and the result was that many of the resolutions uh, adopted were ambiguous and sometimes even inconsistent with the previous resolutions. And we were flooded with almost 200 resolutions and presidential statements. Uh, and in the case of some other successful operations, like Cambodia, half a dozen resolutions were more than enough to give uh, clear guidelines for the conduct of operation on the ground. So I partly agree with you that this unity among the major powers was a detrimental factor. I, but the veto would be a mechanical manifestation to reflect such disunity. And underlying the veto was this uh, divergence of interest. And uh, many people now say that, of course, it would be nice if veto is eliminated from the charter. But uh, they recognize that this will be difficult. And major powers, including the United States, are unlikely to accept 
such a, a drastic change. Therefore, there's, there are, there's thinking, uh, there's a groping towards more restrained, more restricted use of veto, perhaps applying it only with regard to chapter seven action, which is the most serious action. Thank you, um, Under Secretary General, for coming um, to speak uh, to the Kennedy School today. Um, my name is uh, Yasuki Sato, and uh, I'm a student, um, second year student at the Kennedy School here. Um, I have a question. Um, I was uh, impressed, you did not mention it today, but uh, one thing I was impressed about what you said was that um, uh, the question is, what is the most important thing when you, you conduct a peacekeeping operation? And your answer was uh, to to um, to attain lesser evil, that was your answer. It was it was not to attain a good, but a lesser evil. And I kind of find this um, origin from uh, Oriental philosophy background. I mean, I myself, a Japanese, feel something to a certain when I conduct something, I want to do something lesser evil than doing something good. If you can't do good, yeah. um, and uh, I partly think that Cambodia. A lot of people in Cambodia also thought that lesser evil was a good thing, and that kind of matched the operation, the people's feeling. And I, the, maybe I'm not right, but I thought this was kind of um, the reason for success. In Bosnia, well, as you said, um, some state will say, we want the status quo. Some people would say, we want something good. And these philosophical, I mean, I just wanted to ask you today, how would this oriental kind of philosophy could contribute? I mean, like in Cambodia, a success to UN future UN peacekeeping mission. If US orient, like the trend is now, US is taking the role. I don't think it's gonna use lesser evil. Like the philosophy is not lesser evil. I think obviously think so. But how would you think, like if the major powers are Western, you cannot use this philosophy, but how would you think this oriental philosophy could be utilized in international peacekeeping? That's, that's, that's the question. I really am interested. Um, I'm not sure whether my action or my thinking uh, was uh, based on, on our oriental philosophy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, so bad assumption. <laughs> but uh, if you are a practitioner in uh, diplomacy or in peacekeeping, you are confronted with constantly with ambiguous situations. A situation which is not entirely white, a situation which is not entirely black, and you are confronted with a lot of shades of gray. And when you examine alternatives before you, uh, there are advantages, there are disadvantages in each option. And you consult with uh, your colleagues from many different countries. You consult with the military as well as civilians working with you. And uh, after listening most carefully to various views, then you have to make a choice. You are not absolutely sure whether you have a chosen right or not. And all the choices within a particular situation contain advantages and disadvantages. And ultimately, you choose one, not because it was absolutely good, but because it was less evil than some other choices. And uh, so uh, you have to make a very thorough examination of all the possibilities before you, all the resources at your disposal, and you have to act within the mandate given to you by the Security Council and by the UN Secretary General. And uh, the choices are often uh, hair splitting. But uh, after having received the best advice and the best possible information, you make a choice. And you usually do not regret it. Uh, only on one or two occasions, I feel that uh, I made a wrong choice. Although the other choices I made 
were criticized, condemned at times by one party or by another, uh, I had the peace of mind that I did my very best effort in the spirit of uh, objectivity and impartiality and within the limits of uh, resources at hand. And uh, so uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether this is an oriental approach or not, but I think this is a professional approach of uh, UN mediators and peacekeepers. Uh, and uh, so it is uh, important that you act on the basis of certain clear-cut, universally accepted uh, principles. And if your action or consequences of your action are not uh, all that good, at least you have the satisfaction of having acted on the basis of these principles. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is uh, Nyagaka Ongeri. I'm at uh, the business school. I have a question for you. Uh, Germany has been venturing, um, cautiously so, but uh, you know, pretty progressively towards peacekeeping activities over the last few years. Do you think that it's time for Japan to do the same thing? And do you think it's time for Japan to be more proactive in terms of military peacekeeping around the world as it takes on a, a lot, much larger leadership role in the world today? Uh, <clears throat> That's a good question, and whenever I talk with uh, Japanese leaders, I encourage them uh, to be more forthcoming in cooperating with uh, UN efforts in peacekeeping. And I cite the example of Germany. I cite the examples of uh, the Korea, the, the Republic of Korea, Malaysia, and other countries who are more active than Japan. But uh, we must recognize that Japan is just sort of uh, recovering from or emerging from the trauma of its uh, post Second World War uh, experiences. Up until 1945, Japan subscribed to a very aggressive militaristic policy. The post-war Japan, transformed under the new constitution, subscribes to peace, international cooperation, human rights, and all of that. But post-war Japanese internationalism has a strong tinge of isolationism. But I think it is good that Japan has pacifist, anti-militarist uh, attitude. But it should not become pacifist isolationism. It should become active internationalism or active pacifism. And so I would like to see Japan becoming more active in peacekeeping field. Uh, having said that, as you know, Japan has been very active in economic development of developing countries. Uh, Japan has uh, spearheaded a number of initiatives in, in, in that uh, direction. And in peacekeeping area, Japan has concentrated on providing logistics and transportation rather than providing combat to troops. I'd like to see some evolution, some uh, progress in that regard, like you do. Uh, uh, but uh, each country has its own way of contributing to the work of the United Nations. And financial and economic contribution is one. Humanitarian contribution is another. Logistical contribution is the third. Uh, but uh, I'd like to see the gradual expansion of uh, Japan's uh, contributions to the United Nations and uh, a, a new role uh, to be uh, played by Japan. My name is Furukawa, I'm from Japan and studying at this Kennedy School. Um, I'd like to know your idea as to how you think about the establishing, uh, establishment of the UN standing force. Also, you refer to the need to expand the uh, capability of UN standby uh, some, some kind of military force. But it uh, seems to me that uh, even this has been achieved, uh, uh, UN will still have lots of difficulties in uh, implementing uh, intervention at uh, 
early stage of conflict with a sufficient military capability uh, due to the different uh, uh, due to the process of coordinating the different rules of engagement and lots of political considerations. So it uh, seems to me if you are to achieve your uh, what, what you uh, said, uh, I think the UN is uh, standing multi, uh, no, you understand the military force will be essential. Uh, what do you think about this point? I would like to see a standing UN force established, but I also recognize that it will be quite some time before that can be done. Then the second best alternative is a standby arrangement by which like-minded uh, UN member states uh, provide for use by the United Nations and set aside part of its armed forces and uh, give them uh, special training uh, for the purpose of uh, UN peacekeeping. Even if uh, standing arrangement can be achieved, probably at the first stage, it will be for classical peacekeeping under Chapter 6 and to have uh, standing force for Chapter 7 operations will be uh, significantly more difficult and more challenging. So I think uh, we should start from uh, where we can and uh, build up from standby arrangements to standing arrangements eventually, from Chapter 6 type of activities to eventually Chapter 7. Having said that, I'd like to also to point out that uh, between Chapter 6 and Chapter 7, there's a large space and a lot of nuances. And UN in Bosnia was criticized for sticking to Chapter 6 classical peacekeeping, but its operation gradually became more Chapter 7 type without the kinds of resources and equipment and the arms necessary for a Chapter 7 type of operation. UN is more and more involved in civil war situations, ethnic conflicts, and I think we have to, we are compared to go beyond traditional type of uh, uh, inter, uh, interposing ourselves between established armed forces between different member states uh, into a struggle involving uh, undisciplined, uh, uh, ill-organized, uh, informal forces, militias, uh, and uh, other uh, factions. And uh, in this case, we have to be more robust than traditional peacekeeping of uh, based on Chapter 6. But uh, Chapter 7 military action uh, is something uh, we must do uh, under certain circumstances. Uh, but uh, before military action is envisaged, in many cases, we might resort to diploma other diplomatic and economic means, economic sanctions, uh, the uh, the uh, diplomatic sanctions, uh, all of which are provided also under Chapter 7. Uh, we should exhaust all non-violent means before thinking of military enforcement. And I have a, a feeling that we still have a large unexplored domain uh, for future UN action in that sense. Uh, somewhere uh, between Chapter 6 and Chapter 7. So we have to have Chapter 6 action, Chapter 7 action, Chapter 6 and a half or 6 and uh, 3 quarters action, and increasingly Chapter 8 action involving more the regional organizations. For instance, with regard to Great Lakes in Africa, as you know, OAU is closely cooperating with the United Nations. In the crisis in uh, Liberia, ECOWAS uh, uh, has provided ECOMOG, composed of Nigeria and uh, other countries, 
uh, in that sub-regional grouping. And in the case of uh, former Yugoslavia, there's no need for me to mention NATO, which uh, worked uh, with the United Nations, although the conflict and the rivalry between NATO and the United Nations was very much uh, publicized. Uh, the fact of the matter was that there were many more instances of cooperation be between these organizations. And in that way, in many cases, UN cannot do it alone. UN has to work not only with the member states, but with regional and sub-regional organizations. And this will be more and more uh, in evidence in the future. Uh, good afternoon. My name is John MacArthur. I'm a Kennedy School student here. And I'm just wondering, um, your thesis about expanded UN peace missions and uh, talking about demo demo building democratic institutions and the role of uh, human rights and building judiciaries. And at the same time, you spoke a bit about the problems of mission creep in recent UN missions. And there seems to be an inherent tension between those two ideas. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a bit about, in operational terms, how to prevent those types of problems of mission creep as UN missions expand into less military type roles and at the same time on how the military itself, you talked about the role of how to specify uh, different military personnel and how they need to be specifically trained for different operations and a bit more about what your vision is in operational terms about how to make your thesis uh, come to fruition. I thought that uh, at Harvard, when you come to Harvard, the contradictions in your thesis will be sooner or later found out, and that's the case. Uh, no, I think we have to guard against mission creep. Uh, it's important to know exactly uh, what can be achieved and what sh should not be expected of a peacekeeping operation. And when there's a clear uh, restrictions on the number, arms, training, intelligence, command structure, and so forth, which limit the scope of uh, an operation. And that's why we have to be careful not to overburden uh, UN peacekeeping or peacekeepers with uh, an impossible mission to fulfill. But more and more, UN Ha finds itself in the context of a comprehensive, holistic set of objectives, uh, starting from preventive diplomacy into uh, post-conflict as well as pre-conflict peace building, uh, involving resources uh, on economic side, uh, also, UN is involved increasingly in the question of governance of uh, many states in distress, some of which are described as failed states. Uh, in this case, and in actual fact, in countries like Rwanda, uh, UN is helping with the improvement of the uh, judicial system uh, upgrading of uh, prisons uh, uh, and training of uh, lawyers, things like that, which uh, had not been done uh, in the past. And uh, the peacekeeping operation in Cambodia was much more than a simple military operation. As you know, we had the human rights component, repatriation of refugee component, uh, human rights, uh, the 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 uh, the uh, the uh, economic uh, recovery component, civil administration component, uh, and so forth, so on. It was a, almost case like a governmental function which uh, UN had to fulfill. And to that extent, uh, some people say that perhaps UN left Cambodia with its mission unfulfilled. And here we are in a dilemma in the sense that UN is in a serious economic difficulty, financial difficulty. And we cannot 
expect to stay in a certain country or in a certain situation beyond a certain time. So we have to think very seriously of exit strategy. In fact, it is ironic that even before we go in, we think of our exit. Building up democracy is, however, a long-term project. And we were criticized for leaving Cambodia after two years. But uh, then how long uh, do you have to stay? It took uh, 300 years for the United Kingdom to build up its democracy. It took more than 200 years for the United States to build up its democracy. And these countries are still tinkering with uh, their democracy. So what we can do is to at least sow the seeds of democracy and to strengthen the local capacity to build up and encourage the, the local NGOs, hum, humanitarian human rights NGOs, to do the work after our departure. And perhaps continue international oversight responsibility through small offices and through the visits of uh, human rights rapporteurs and by other means. So we have very long range ambitious aims and frameworks. Uh, at the same time, what we can do actually through peacekeeping missions have to be uh, planned and executed with precision and with the financial means uh, in mind also. Good afternoon. My name is Waguri Hiroshi from Fletcher. And uh, I have two questions. Number one, I think you mentioned the importance of the um, democratization as a current or future UN operation. But however, I think that the UN has nothing to do with the internal political regime. It doesn't have the authority, but it, it doesn't have ex explicitly the authority to do that. How do you think about it? And the second question is, uh, I think you mentioned uh, the, also the importance of the UN standby force or UN forces under the seventh chapter. I think you're right, you're very right, but however, after, even after the Cold War, end of the Cold War, we haven't seen such kind of things. I think it, there, must have been, there must have been a very big reason of that failure. How do, how do, what do you think the major reason for that failure? And what, how do you think we can overcome it? That's a question. The, I think uh, we can make progress first uh, uh, in answer to your second question, we can make progress towards uh, uh, standing force or with elaborate standby arrangements only through a painstaking process of uh, persuading member states that it will be in their interest uh, to have such means to secure uh, international security and uh, peace. Uh, it will take a lot of time. As I said, the euphoria post Cold War, euphoria is gone. And uh, there's uh, creeping uh, isolationism in many member states. Uh, and so for the time being, <coughs> we have to be contented perhaps with uh, uh, developing standby arrangements in which nations set aside part of their armed forces for ad hoc use by the United Nations with their agreement. Um, your first question uh, was? Yeah, oh, first question is the word of democratization. Eh? Oh, the word of democratization. You mentioned that democratization as a very important part of UN. Uh -huh, yes. Um, as you know, UN Charter has Article 2, Paragraph 7, uh, by which uh, the UN or international community is uh, prohibited from interfering in domestic matters of member states. This is a sacrosanct principle of international law. But more and more human rights, democracy, the decent treatment of uh, citizens have become a matter, a subject of uh, 
international concern. And so UN pronouncing itself on these matters is not considered as a violation of Article 2, Paragraph 7 anymore. I think in the last 50 years of its existence, UN has evolved, international opinions have evolved. And yet, of course, I recognize that still we have to respect national sovereignty and territorial independence of uh, UN member states. And nations should be allowed to develop as they see fit. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, in this age of uh, communication and uh, universality of exchange and uh, dialogue, there are certain universal standards for governance, for human rights, which have developed and are still developing and expanding. And so we have to balance these factors of to what extent nations should be allowed to develop in their own way, and to what extent they should be uh, asked and uh, persuaded uh, to comply with these uh, expanding areas of universal uh, standards of behavior. Uh, and it's, it's uh, sometimes uh, difficult uh, to take a decision on a specific case, but uh, I think with these basic elements in mind, I think we are going in the direction of a broader universal action and lesser uh, independent national action. But we have to be prudent in uh, defining the particular steps to be taken on the way. Last point. Hello, my name is Michael Sporluk, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. In July 1995, Srebrenica and Zsepa to uh, safe havens, to UN designated safe havens, um, fell to Serbian aggression. And I wanted to ask you, what should the UN have done to protect those areas? Uh, in actual fact, I don't think there was much United Nations or AMPROFO could have done uh, in, that, in the circumstance of July uh, 1995. Um, <clears throat> we had uh, about 250 Dutch troops and uh, they had to confront uh, several thousand advancing Serb forces. No member states provided us the advance intelligence as to the Serb intentions. The Serbs advanced and they stopped. They advanced and they stopped. It was an agonizing decision on the part of the force commander, General Jambi and myself, whether we should ask for NATO's air support. And the only air support which was uh, under consideration was so-called close air support action by NATO, not full-scale uh, uh, bombing attacks. And uh, I listened very carefully to uh, General Jambier's recommendation, and uh, uh, it was only on the morning of, uh, of 11th of uh, July that uh, I, uh, he came to, to me asking for this authorization, which I immediately granted. And in the meantime, the Bosnian Muslim troops had evaporated. They were gone. Uh, they were protecting the enclave, but uh, they were gone and the Serbs kept uh, coming. And by that afternoon the, uh, of uh, the 11th of July, the Serbs already came very close to the town of uh, Srebrenica and uh, 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 close air support action did not have much uh, effect uh, on the Serb military action. And in the meantime, I received a telephone call from uh, the Dutch uh, defense minister who asked me to suspend the NATO air action because the, uh, the, the Serbs were too close to the Dutch troops uh, guarding that town. So 
in that concrete situation, I don't think we could have done uh, much. And uh, I, I think that Dutch troops acted with courage and the competence. I think we have to come to the whole question of the concept of safe areas uh, and whether safe areas were really safe and whether UN peacekeepers were given enough means, enough arms to defend these safe areas. My answer is definitely no. The uh, UN Secretary General asked for 34,000 uh, troops uh, for six safe areas and was given only 7,000 troops who arrived one year late. late. Uh, I think safe area concept should have been changed to a demilitarized zone concept uh, by which the armed forces of all warring factions should have been, uh, uh, should have been uh, exempted, should, have been, uh, should not have been allowed to station in these so-called safe areas. But since the Bosnian uh, government forces were allowed to station their troops to uh, refit, uh, to have uh, um, uh, uh, recuperation in these areas and to use them also as command centers, it gave the pretext to the Serbs to attack these areas. Had they been completely demilitarized for all factions, there would have been no excuse for any attacks. So one should revisit the Geneva Convention's notion of demilitarized neutral zones. But safe areas um, for were perceived as partial, partial to the uh, Bosnian government forces. And uh, UN Secretary General, uh, in his two reports, told Security Council that these concepts are not uh, defendable concepts uh, in the circumstances of, uh, of Bosnia. Uh, many of them were even not defined, uh, geographically speaking. So nobody knew where they started and where they ended. So it was one of those uh, hasty reaction to the unfolding acts of uh, uh, human uh, 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 cruelty. And it was not well thought out. And so I think in the future it is very important when we think of how to cope with humanitarian challenges that uh, we should be very well aware of the resources required uh, the, and the soundness of the concepts to be also implemented. Well, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Kennedy School, I want to thank you on this late on a Friday afternoon for being so attentive and for the quality of your questions. And for Mr. Akashi, of course, he, he really does have one of the most difficult jobs in the world. On, upon his efforts and his department in the United Nations, they quite literally the fate of Hundreds of thousands of people rest from North Korea to Burundi to Iraq, Afghanistan. So we are delighted that you could take the time to visit us, to educate us, and then the storms are ahead. You have our best wishes for Godspeed and good luck. Thank you.